Okay, everybody, I would like to get started. I think there's still some stragglers coming in, but they can find a seat as they come. So, so welcome, uh, welcome everyone to our forum tonight. And, you know, we're really here this evening to share our, our ideas about Marin's future. Uh, one of our speakers, John King, in a recent article noted that most of us define the Bay Area in our own way. We carry our own region with us, an archipelago of settings where we live and where we work. I think most of us also define Marin County in our own way. And it is those visions of Marin that we're here to discuss this evening. What are our values, our needs, and our priorities both now and into the future? How do we think Marin County might change over the next 40 years? How do we want to address the challenges we face, such as climate change, sea level rise, and an aging population? How do we best meet economic equity and environmental needs and create livable, healthy communities? That's a lot to solve in one evening. Uh, and so I'm really hoping, I'm very excited to have been asked to moderate uh, our program tonight, and I'm really hoping that this is the first in a series of conversations about all of these issues. Um, before we get started, I want to really acknowledge and thank our sponsoring organizations, the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative, Sustainable Marin, Sustainable San Rafael, the Marin Conservation League, Marin County League of Women Voters, and Marin TV Channel 26. So we're going to have a panel presentation, as you know, of four fabulous speakers. And then after that, we will have an hour uh, for questions and comments from the public. Uh, part of that time, we want to use questions and comments on speaker cards on index cards, and so I hope folks have gotten index cards. We have people, Kiki is handing them out on that side. Um, so uh, she'll hand out the cards and she will retrieve them and give them to me, and I'll ask questions after the car off of the cards. We also wanna give some time for people to stand up and just ask a question or make a comment at a microphone, so we're doing sort of a combination of, of ways to have public input this evening. Um, I have a number of electeds in the, in the room that I'd like to acknowledge, and if I miss anybody, my apologies. I can't see a thing from up here, and, um, and so I'm back to relying on Greg Brockbank, and we know what that's like. But I, but I, do, know, I do know that my colleague Steve Kinsey is in the room, uh, and we also have Pam Hartwell Herrero, the mayor, mayor of Fa Fairfax, David Weinsoff from the Fairfax Town Council, Diane First, the Coromadera Town Council, uh, Jean McCleary, Nevada Town Council, Pat Eklund, Mayor Pro Tem of Nevada, Madeline Kellner, Nevada Town Council, uh, Alice Fredericks, Tiburon Town Council, Linda Jackson, San Rafael School Board, and uh, I hope to see all of you later after I get out of this bright light. Um, so, we're, we have sort of an odd way that we're going to do things here. Our first speaker, Bob Brown, has a PowerPoint presentation. Ah, did I forget a colleague? <laughs> I, I recognize Steve. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Bob Brown, because he has a, a PowerPoint presentation. And then after he's done, I'll introduce the rest of our speakers who will come up and, and sit at the panel. So uh, Bob, as, as I know most of you know, has been a community development director or planning manager for over 35 years in Bay Area communities, including the cities of San Rafael, Palo Alto, San Mateo, Berkeley, and Milpitas. Bob also was the sustainability coordinator for the city of San Rafael, where he authored San Rafael's climate change Ac action plan and the BURST model green building ordinance, one of the most stringent in the nation. Bob is an adjunct faculty member at Dominican University teaching in the Sustainable Practices Certificate Program. He holds a BS in Environmental Biology from the University of Santa Clara and a Master's in Urban and Regional Planning from San Jose State University. Please everybody welcome Bob Brown to the podium. see what you mean about the lights. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank all of you so much for coming out tonight, and I really am looking forward to hearing your thoughts and reactions uh, in our dialogue later. Um, let's see. 
Does this work? Yes. I show this image really for two reasons. Uh, first, it, it symbolizes our hope tonight to have sort of a higher level discussion about Marin's long range planning. Uh, personally, I think in the last year and a half, we, we've sort of been debating and losing ourselves in the details of numbers. And I fear that we sort of lost sort of the, the again, the, the big picture. And so that's really what tonight's all about. This also, I would suggest, is one of the principal responsibilities of a city planner, being stuck up there on the mast, uh, which is really to keep an eye out on the horizon for threats to our communities. And frankly, in 35 years of environmental planning and being a planning director, I have never seen anything as threatening as climate change. This is another job of the planner. Uh, to get the word out about these impending threats and to try to rally public discussion and action. And I don't think we've done a very good job of that. Um, and I think we'd all agree that the one Bay Area process has really been a missed opportunity for that kind of, of regional discussion that we really need. So tonight, I'd sort of like to start again with the big picture and, and move down. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, the global. <laughs> and then move to the state, and then the Bay Area, and finally home here to Marin, all in 12 minutes. My first point is really a very simple one, and that is climate change is real, it's happening, and we're seeing the early results everywhere. So scientists and all of the G8 nation, uh, nations agree that anything over a two degrees Celsius temperature rise will have catastrophic and probably irreversible consequences. The average global temperature has already increased by 0.8 degrees Celsius over the last century. This summer, very narrow slice of time, but the US average was a, a one and a half degrees Celsius over that average. The World Bank says that if we're seeing the results of a 0.8 degree increase, two degrees is just downright scary. And this is what climatologist James Hansen has to say about that. This summer, we've broken 28,000 daily heat records across the United States. And we're experiencing the worst drought since the Dust Bowl days. The West, uh, and this is not just an isolated United States phenomenon, this is happening globally. There have been severe droughts in India this summer, China, parts of Canada, parts of Africa. This was Europe last year. And the West has been burning all summer long. This diagram shows the projected increases in wildfires that are predicted from a one degree Celsius increase. And what that looks like in Marin is a three to four fold increase in fire potential, and that's just within the next couple of decades. The same is holding true with weather disasters. We've had $12 billion plus weather disasters in the US last year. And that was more in one year than we had in the entire decade of the 1980s. There was $52 billion worth of damages and over 1,000 lives lost in the US alone. This is what the third largest insurance company in the world says about that. They're the ones that are really freaked out by this because they're going to have to suffer the financial consequences of insuring all these properties from this kind of damage. I heard someone say recently that watching the evening news now is like reading the book of Revelations. So putting aside all of the huge environmental and social impacts, I've only got 12 minutes, of having to adapt to significant climate change, I guess what offends me personally the most is that I think we're mortgaging our children's economic future. They're going to have to pay for a drastically modified state water system that's not dependent upon a Sierra snowpack in the summer. They're also going to have to pay to protect $46 billion worth of public and private improvements in the Bay Area alone that will be subject to inundation within the next few decades. And given all these dire in-your-face warnings, how are we responding? Not too well. Globally, emissions are up this past year, and of course China is really on the rise. 
So our reaction in the United States, I guess I'd sort of characterize it this way, <laughs> particularly at the federal level. At the federal level in Washington, we seem to have absolutely no solutions coming out. But thankfully, California does. We've adopted a very bold plan, AB 32, which is frankly a grand experiment with a goal of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions from this projection down to that. So how are we gonna do that? It takes a lot of, of different um, types of initiatives that make that happen, and land use is a part of it. It's projected to be 7% of the total. And if you agree with me that significantly responding to greenhouse gas emissions is an imperative, then every one of these wedges becomes really important. My next point is that how we develop in the future, our future growth patterns, really does make a difference. And we have options. So when we look at some of the impacts of future growth, let's just look at land consumption, chewing up additional farmland or open space. When you look at different patterns of growth, the middle one is what I would call compact growth, and that's only about 14 units an acre. So that's a pretty moderate density. But these are the kinds of differences it creates. So just in terms of the amount of land we chew up for new growth, a big difference, about one quarter as much. In terms of carbon emissions, about half as much for a more compact growth pattern. Vehicular travel, about two and a half times less. And finally, the amount of budget the households have spent on transportation, also a bit less. More money they can devote to housing costs. What this chart suggests is that traffic generation relates to even small increases in density. And that's not to say that additional growth won't create more traffic. That's foolish. Of course it will. Marin's been growing about a half a percent a year for the past 20 years. But our traffic increases have greatly exceeded that. So the question really is how are we going to minimize traffic growth in the future from future development? People who live in walkable neighborhoods with nearby services are five times more likely to walk, which also as an ancillary benefit addresses our obesity epidemic. A study put out this summer by the Brookings Institute suggests that housing in walkable neighborhoods with services nearby have held their value much better across the whole country, even during the recession. So there is a demand for this type of living style. So now to the Bay Area. This is how we grew in the post-war period to today. So again, starting from today, this is how SB 375, the Sustainable Community Strategy, projects future development. So I'll leave it up to you to judge which is a better strategy, to continue to push out in the region or to try to accommodate future growth within the currently developed area. The last question I'd like to pose to you is, are we building the types of housing that we need for our future? So here's a few little tidbits of demographics. So at least in my lifetime, the size, the number of people per household has greatly decreased. And yet, for some reason, the size of our homes keeps increasing. Back in 1960, two thirds of Marin households were families with kids. And when I ask in my classes what people think it is today, I usually get about 50% or whatever. No, the reality is only a quarter of Marin households have children at home. This slide demonstrates the gray tsunami, the silver tsunami we're gonna be seeing. So right now, one in four are considered seniors. In another 18 years, about a third of Marinites will be seniors. So again, different housing is needed. Looking at price, of course, it goes without saying that housing prices in Marin remain very high in the region. But in the past 20 years, three quarters of the jobs we created have been low wage, low income jobs. What's the result? It's obvious. Over half our workforce has to commute into Marin each day, which means traffic and gridlock on 101, morning and night. So again, just some, some thoughts to share and we can discuss them a little bit later. So I guess just to sum up, 
I guess I would say climate change is real. We're just beginning to experience the changes, and I fear it's going to cost our children dearly. Continued growth in the Bay Area is inevitable, but we can choose how we grow, which has effects on greenhouse gas emissions and future traffic growth. And finally, future growth isn't one size fits all. It's about having choices for different types of households. So again, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I'd now like to introduce the, our three other speakers and ask them to come up to the dais, and I'm hoping whoever can do the magic about putting that screen up will do so if possible. Um, so our next speaker uh, is the Reverend Betty Padgett. Uh, Betty is a native Californian with time studying and working in New York, Paris, and Lucknow, India. She has lived in the Ross Valley since 1981. Betty is a United Methodist minister who served in parish and campus ministries at the Church Center for the UN and for 16 years as Director of Education and Advocacy for Ecumenical Association for Housing. She tends a large garden and spends as much time as possible with two little grandsons. Her interest in ancient history has led to spending time the last few years around the Aegean and the Mediterranean in Turkey and Greece. Oma Village, a grassroots project that Betty started to support Homeward, homeward Bound's work with homeless families with children, is her current volunteer passion. Our next speaker is Nona Dennis, who I really feel needs no introduction, but I'll just go ahead and do it anyway. Um, Nona has been involved in environmental issues. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nona has been involved in environmental issues either as a consultant, teacher, or volunteer for 40 years. A return to education launched her into the emerging environmental profession of the early 1970s, where she worked as a consultant in wetlands ecology habitat restoration and environmental impact analysis. During the 1990s, Nona taught environmental philosophy and ethics as adjunct faculty at the University of San Francisco. Since retiring in 1998, she has served on a number of planning advisory committees and continues to volunteer with the Environmental Forum of Marin and the Marin Conservation League. And our final speaker will be John King. John is the San Francisco Chronicle's urban design critic, a post he created in 2001. And he's also the author of Cityscape, San Francisco and Its Buildings, published last year by Heyday. His work has also appeared in such publications as Dwell, Met Metropolis, and The American Scholar. I confess I read none of those, so he's got a lot to educate me about. Uh, at the Chronicle, his beats before architecture included San Francisco City Hall, so he knows the intersection of development and politics. John is an honorary member of the American Society of Landscape Architects and recipient of awards from the California Preservation Foundation and the state chapters of the American Planning Association and the American Institute of Architects. Welcome all of you. So. So Betty, I think we'd like to start with you and then, and then proceed in order. Good evening. Every morning when the clock radio comes on with the traffic reports, I'm glad that we decided to rent near work and services in a walkable neighborhood. We're glad to have a landlord who doesn't keep raising rents, and we're blessed to live near our grandchildren. Housing, after all, is first a matter of home, the foundation of family, neighborhood, community, intergenerational, interdependent, mixed income, sustainable communities. Unfortunately, we've not been creating that kind of place. Could you buy your home now? Do you know someone with a housing problem? Maybe your children or your parents or a colleague? Do you know where the people who serve you live? First, I want to give a framework for talking about housing choices, and then six needed actions. Bob points to the fact that we've not created the housing options we need. Housing we need, not because of a state law or ABAG, but because of our community needs. We have very limited growth in Marin. We've created a service economy. The largest job sectors are retail, restaurant, and healthcare. 
Even if we paid those people more, there would not be housing choices for them. With very limited rentals available, vacancy rates are abnormally low in Marin, making possible some of the highest rents in the nation. The median one-bedroom apartment rent requires an income of $55,700 to afford it. That leaves out two-thirds of all Marin employees. Think of the impact of paying more than a half of your income for rent. It leaves behind many two-parent families, both working full-time but unable to support two children. Our Marin working families are struggling to survive. That's in addition to the 60,000 workers who commute into the county every day, 54% of whom earn 40,000 a year or less. And most of those in service work for us. 40 years ago, setting aside inland rural and coastal Marin was groundbreaking and we want to protect that. However, planning for the 101 corridor has left us with a lack of housing and transit options that very much limit a future that is balanced and sustainable. We need to acknowledge that our land use policies are exclusionary. We are having a negative impact on our region and we have left out our workforce. Now we need to decide to do the comprehensive planning necessary to create an environmentally friendly future that is also economically sustainable and more equitable as well. That is the top Marin agenda for the next 40 years. Our changing demographics call for this too. Smaller households, millennials and seniors have similar housing needs and desires to drive less, have transit alternatives, live in pedestrian oriented neighborhoods, a recent APA survey on ideal communities found the highest priorities are locally owned businesses nearby, staying in the neighborhood while aging, sidewalks, transit, and a range of housing. A retired Bay Area leader once said that the only thing people dislike more than sprawl is density. <laughs> we have been developing. It's just that we've developed with large homes and shopping centers. And it's time we find new suburban models. Yes, even some 30 units to the acre. And we can look at towns around the world that work to give us ideas. After my time in the Mediterranean's wonderful little dense towns and villages, I've decided that Marin never had enough pirates. <laughs> we need the political will to enact six very specific areas of change. And I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones that I've thought of that are most important. First, local streams of financing. Higher land cost and lower density mean we have to be willing to pay for it. We need local streams of financing that give us choices and involvement. Impact fees on large new or major remodel single family homes. Jobs housing mitigation fees. And we need to consider designating annual amounts for housing trust funds from some ongoing source like hotel occupancy tax or transfer taxes. Second, second units are talked about all the time, but they aren't happening in any number and they won't unless we waive the high fees and develop some kind of resource center to help people add legal second units. They won't solve all our housing problems, but they will create a more flexible housing stock and serve some needs. Third, we have to get real to make mixed use happen. It requires more height and good design because of the added cost of that kind of construction, and we need guidelines in place. We need to include as sites public buildings, big box, retail, office, and parking. Airspace is a crucial resource that we aren't using. Fourth, the housing priority is downtowns and transit corridors. Housing revitalizes downtowns. People who live downtown spend 10 times more than people who work there. It makes sense. There are 10,000 jobs within walking distance of the Civic Center. One of our towns likes to think it's a rural community while taking sales tax from two large shopping centers right on Highway 101. San Rafael and Nevada are wonderful small cities and could be model small cities. We could actually enhance the lives of those who live here and our unique downtowns. We need to change the way we evaluate traffic for downtown housing. Statistics show much lower auto use and much higher transit use. 
We need to look at the sizes of units. We talk about units like they're all created equal, but a 3,000 square foot home has a lot more impact than a small attached unit. These housing units that are smaller and downtown and on transit corridors also support transit in greater numbers. Fifth, we need to address the varied real needs of housing in Marin. We have agricultural workers who are by and large year-round workers who are living in substandard housing that doesn't meet code, and it's unacceptable as we emphasize eating local and organic. Seniors aging in place in the grayingest county in the state, and housing for those who work for them, low-wage working families. Rental housing is the priority. It's the base of the housing pyramid. It would be nice to have more ownership under 400,000. Co-housing is a lovely dream. Perhaps a different way of planning and more varied ways to achieve it could get us there. Sixth and last, we need to reduce barriers and the cost of housing through comprehensive planning. We need rezoning in place. We need a public process that's effective for everybody. We need knowledge of what makes a site competitive for financing, and we need to maximize our local resources. We need parking standards that are appropriate to the kind of housing. These changes are a basis for real housing choices in the future. We need options that maximize use of our limited land, disperse costs, benefit seniors and working families, and reduce trip generation. Charles McGlashan said, workforce housing is a triple win for sustainability. It reduces commutes that mean less greenhouse gas pollution, more dollars spent locally, and more time to give to family, friends, and community. And it can be done well. Thank you, Betty. Nona? Uh, good evening. Uh, for those of you who came to solve local immediate environmental issues over the next 40 years, you're going to be disappointed because we are taking this bird's eye view, a distant view, looking down <coughs> at some broad premises. And two of those premises have been framed by the, the two previous speakers. The first one, in reverse order. Uh, the first premise, there are two, two premises are, have kind of framed the discussion for tonight. Uh, and in reverse order of the speakers. Uh, the first one is that uh, there will be some growth in population in Marin County over the next 35 to 40 years, even at our constant low rate of between one and 2% growth per decade, there will be continued growth. The second premise is and we need to accommodate that growth. The second premise is that <clears throat> the challenges of a, clean, of, a, of a changing climate dictate that we reduce or we mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and that we adapt to the effects of, of uh, climate change which are already beginning and evident. Um, because personal auto use accounts for some 50% of the county's emissions, it follows that any means, all the means that Bob <clears throat> excuse me, outlined, all those means are important in attempting to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including promoting walkable, bikeable communities, communities that are close to shops, services, schools, and so forth. So I want to look at those two premises over the next 40 years from an environmental perspective. Some of you are familiar with Community Marin, which is an environmental blueprint written first in 1991 it's been revised several times. It's in its third revision now. And it supports the premise that urban growth is acceptable in the right locations, not in areas of natural resource values or hazards, not in green fields, but rather within existing developed areas served by public transit, close to existing services, and consistent with environmental protections. There's nothing new here. This is probably 20 years old, and it hasn't changed. Further, it recommends that any new development should maintain the existing scale and enhance the historic community-centered character of Marin while protecting green belts and community separators. Again, nothing new. Community growth, uh, Marin also acknowledges, however, 
that ultimately there is a limit to growth and where it can occur in Marin County. And why? Why is that? Well, roughly 48%, most of you know this, 48% of Marin is in public ownership, our parks, our watersheds, our open spaces. Another 36% is in productive agricultural land, and that enjoys a high level of protection under zoning and easements and so forth. Both of these, protect these protections are the product of decades, decades of overwhelming public effort and political support. So what's another constraint to our ultimate limits, our, our ultimate limits to growth? Geography limits the county's physical capacity for growth. We've filled our valleys, we've filled Ross Valley, Tam Valley, uh, Nevada Valleys, San Rafael, and so forth. And our houses have climbed the, the slopes of rugged terrain that are accessible, in some cases barely accessible, even by automobiles, let alone bicycles or pedestrians. On the bay side, we have created new land <clears throat> out of non-land, a uh, wetland. And these are lands that are going to be flooded in the not too distant future unless they're protected under sea level rise. Uh, <clears throat> and we have fully plumbed our water sources, leaving barely enough for fish. We draw from the Russian River and no more water is going to come from these sources except to the extent that we can serve and make more efficient use of those sources. At this point, desalination carries unacceptable environmental impacts and costs. Now, how did all this happen? In the late 1960s, growth seemed unlimited. Marin's population was projected to be 400,000. We had Mar in the 60s, Marincello, Bellinas Lagoon, West Marin Plan, freeways up the west side, freeways across the center of Marin. And that's when the county recognized that the last place wouldn't last if we continued in that direction. And out of those battles, came the, what I, we see, I think, is the basic pattern of Marin today and for the next 40 years, probably. It's the 1973 plan, which laid out three corridors and concentrated growth in the eastern urban corridor. And a fourth, the fourth Baylands corridor, then was added in, 19, in 2007. And as a consequence, our communities are separated by ridgelands, green belts, Marin's parklands and open spaces, protect native habitats, Agricultural easements allow for continued productive agriculture, and our dike historic tidelands are protected. We did something else, however, in 1973. Uh, we encouraged more commercial development because we didn't want to be dependent on commuting out of Marin. We wanted to create more jobs locally, and we did a very good job of it because over the next several decades, the growth in jobs has been two to three times the growth in household formation. As a result, uh, Marin has become a job center with, as Betty pointed out, 60,000 some people commuting in. And we've created a, an enormous, an enormous need. So here we are. We have geography and infrastructure that seriously limit the amount of housing or jobs we can accommodate physically in Marin County. And because of geography and the distribution of jobs and shopping centers and limited public transit options, we are largely dependent at this point on the private automobile, even though our town centers in themselves may be compact and walkable. So will concentrating more growth in our town centers and along transit corridors really reduce our dependency on automobiles? Will it reduce vehicle miles? Will it move the needle very far in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, in preparing for the 2040 general plan update for Mill Valley, Mill Valley found that almost half its working population commutes to jobs outside Marin. And of those, almost half drive 30 miles or more. Mill Valley population, like the county, has grown at a very slow rate. But traffic volumes have grown 20% over the same period as the population has grown 2%. On the plus side, 17% of, those, of, of the Mill Valley residents commute less than 10 minutes. So we have a positive, we have a positive turn there, but we are still heavily dependent on the automobile. So research has found, <clears throat> I think we agree, that compact, denser urban communities reduce auto dependence, 
water usage, other resource uses, and infrastructure costs, but the correlation is not proportional. That is, if you double the densities in an area, you don't expect to reduce by half the vehicle miles traveled. The expected benefit is not quite what it appears to be, and there is that paradox of densification, which I think I've mentioned in a forum about a year and a half ago. We may solve some larger scale national or global problems, like reducing long distance commuting, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, by making our, com our communities more compact and dense, but there can also be locally adverse environmental effects, congestion, pollution, and those we need to think about very carefully and we need to mitigate. And there's the equity issue. <clears throat> Housing near transit is often viewed as undesirable by some. Noisy, unhealthy, subject to poor air quality. It isn't more equitable, is it not more equitable to disperse affordable housing uh, within a community at, at lower densities? This is an alternative that needs to be considered. We may need to, in fact, decouple these two policies that have come together and have been combined, uh, affordable housing policy and greenhouse gas emissions. It is not always possible to solve these two problems uh, with one land use uh, strategy. So finally, frankly, we're looking for solutions, and some of those I'm you know, going to turn to John King for, for some of those. Um, I'm not afraid of density numbers. 30 units per acre is only alarming in the wrong context, with the wrong design, or wrong management. But are there environmentally preferable alternatives to constructing new buildings to expand housing choices and accommodate new jobs, such as repurposing uh, shopping centers, re-examining town centers for unused or poorly used opportunity sites, recycling older single or family housing, allow e easier, less costly second units, consider small pocket neighborhoods of increased density tucked away up in back of, of 101. In reality, concentrating new development, whether housing or jobs, near transit shops and services breaks no new ground for Marin County. Infill development has been recommended in this county for 35 years. At the same time, I agree, I've been reading a, a blog posted by Bob Silvestri, probably many of you have read it. I don't agree with everything that he says by any means, but on this particular issue, particularly when he states that much of future growth should be about renovation, reuse, conservation, and technological refitting, retrofitting, uh, he, he brings up some very good points. I, I believe strongly that we live in a region and we are driven by regional needs, but as he's pointed out, there's also room for a wide variety of locally driven solutions, all of which might be equally sustainable and all of which should be at least on the table for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Nona. And finally, John King. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to start by thanking all of you for being here. Very impressed at the turnout. And uh, I also want to kind of introduce myself. I am the interloper in the audience. I grew up in Walnut Creek. I lived in San Francisco for a time with my wife renting a place. And then we bought a small house in Berkeley when it came time to try and buy a place. And even long ago when I had black hair, San Francisco was unaffordable to a working class journalist. Um, so my experience Marin, with Marin is not as a resident, it's more as a Bay Area person who in college Love to, you know, break away to the coast, whether it was going to Inverness, whether it was seeing Christos running fence go into the sea at Dillon Beach or whatever. And, you know, going, I, the one time I heard Herb Cain give a public lecture was at the Marin Community College, wherever that is. I don't even remember where it was. Um, I was a senior in college, so it was a kind of a whim that I and another co-op resident did. Uh, but essentially what, what strikes me about Marin as a Bay Area resident and as someone who really does care a lot about the region 
and just the kind of physical diversity of it, the different terrains, both natural and built, is what is so striking, I think what draws people to Marin, part of it is the nature, absolutely. And the, again, I, I still, um, I, you know, there's, West Marin is just intoxicating. You know, this summer, my wife and daughter and I, my daughter just starting college, we splurged and um, stayed for, I think, four nights in Stinson Beach. And we had been out there on a gorgeous February weekend day where it was just perfect weather. You could see Sutro Tower and everything like that. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool to get a house on the beach in the, you know, in the gated community area? And uh, my, my wife quickly did a little bit of research and we, we were convinced that it would be cool, but it's nothing we would ever be afford able to afford. So we rented a house you know, up in the hill above Stinson Beach and just spent time there and loved it. Went up to Point Reyes Station, which is you know, one of my favorite like little towns where you can go and really feel like you're in a place and in a variety of communities and activities and places like that, not just within Marin, but <coughs> within the region as a whole. Uh, you know, we had a teenager from France stay with us last summer. We took her to Muir Woods, of course you do that. And we took her to Tiburon so she could see, or not Tiburon, I'm sorry, Sausalito, you know, just to see the view and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, it, it's so much a place to go, but what strikes me to be a bit more critical is that the things that draw people like me here, and I think that draw the visitors who come to Marin, and I think also what probably drew, drew a lot of you to decide to live here, whether it was 50 years ago or 20 years ago or five years ago, tend to be places that have existed for a long time before all the overlap of rules and controls and everything were put into place. You know, you go to a place like Sausalito, you go to a place like, um, you know, kind of down, downtown Ross, that sounds off. Uh, <laughs> Central Ross, whatever you call it. Uh, you know, you, even, you go to San Rafael, things like that. You know, obviously the natural wonders are things that have been in place for so long, but the kind of, the built, the aspects of the built terrain that are compelling are places that were not built with an eye to, you know, basically they were built with an eye to building communities people wanted to be in. Point Reyes Station was built to be a little western farm ranch town. And Sausalito was jammed together like it is. Imagine any density today being allowed like that because everyone had to cluster close to the ferry that was going into the city. Uh, you know, San Ramon has the more kind, I'm sorry, San Ramon, my Contra Costa roots just came out. San Rafael has the more kind of urban grid type of thing because it was the county seat, so on and so forth. And the reason I'm talking about all these things is I think that the other speakers tonight, Bob and Nona and Reverend Paget, really framed the issues for you well. And again, from the global to the local, from the environmental issues to the human issues, I'm talking more from just the kind of, you know, yes, all these issues are true, but just in terms of how do you create places you want to be in? The fact is, for all the wonders of protection that Marin and the Bay Area and the United States have come up with in the last 40 years, we've kind of stopped a lot of things from happening that do make those kind of communities. And I think that as Marin looks to its future, again, the other speakers kind of ticked off all the important things, but I want you to, you know, but it's not, it, it's the classic, it's not because it's medicine, it's because you create good places. And there are just a range of futures. Um, you know, talking about density and stopping sprawl, so on and so forth, what that can conjure up are the big new housing towers in San Francisco. 
you know, the big, the towers you guys don't really see because you're driving over the Golden Gate Bridge, but if you're driving over the Bay Bridge, kaboom, here are all these big new towers. That is one model of density. But if you look in San Francisco and you go to Mission Bay, and while I have a lot of aesthetic problems with Mission Bay, it's very well planned, you've got eight-story buildings. Nothing's higher than 16 stories. But let's step back. I live in Berkeley. Berkeley has aggressively zoned and pushed for ground level retail along major streets like University or San Pablo and then three or four levels of housing above it. And while I can pick aesthetic qualms with things, the fact is the projects for the most part, especially the better designed ones, are very successful. There is a five-story building that has a Trader Joe's at the base and then a lot of housing on top of it. I, high level of affordability, it might be as high as 20%, I'm not sure. And, you know, it's the kind of thing, Berkeley being Berkeley, it was delayed for years by opposition and then challenges to the EIR, I think to lawsuits as well, essentially by a handful of neighbors on the block next to it that equated it with Manhattanization. Um, it opened. There's not gridlock. The sun still shines on the little street behind it. It's hugely popular. Everybody in the neighborhood walks there back and forth, as well as the local markets to the north. But I mean, in other words, there's the San Francisco model. There's this type of model I'm talking with in Berkeley. You have a model, um, Redwood City. There's a lot of effort on the peninsula to try and protect the open spaces, protect the wetlands, though that's kind of fought about in the marshes and things, but kind of strengthen the core of housing along El Camino Real. And Redwood City, which has been pushing to have housing in its downtown, last year I think raised pieces, as heights were raised to go as high as 12 stories, which the notion of a suburban city on the peninsula raising its heights again to essentially what had been stopped in the 60s to me was pretty remarkable but it comes with and I wish I had the wording this wonderful descriptive language that the the ray, the additional height and the new buildings must come in community endorsed architectural styles so it then prescribes so like El Camino Real, it should be in the Spanish mission style. And anyone who's driven up and down El Camino Real will know that there's a lot more than Spanish mission on El Camino Real. <laughs> but it's kind of like, look, we, we can have it both ways. We can raise the heights, but we cannot do the grim modern building that's in downtown San Rafael that makes people recoil, except you know, modernist hipsters who go, wow, that's so cool. Uh, you know, we can do it in kind of more familiar forms. Then if you go to Emeryville, there is a lot of housing there. Very, the density, I don't, I don't have the numbers. I'm not a numbers guy. But it's, uh, a lot of it are essentially very compact, single family attached homes, high levels of density, and then on the main street it steps up to four levels, or I think as high as eight levels in a few places. And then there's another model. If you go up to Windsor and get off the freeway, I don't know how many of you have been to Windsor Village or downtown Windsor or whatever it's called, but you know, not a whole lot of housing, not, not the kind of density we're talking about in downtown San Francisco, but the kind of density that actually makes you go, hey, this is fun to walk around. And I, I haven't been there since the recession really kicked in, so I don't know, you know, when it opened with two independent bookstores, I'm sure at least one is gone now. But I mean, it's the kind of thing that it's like, it's, we can create compact, walkable, denser communities that in fact don't feel hugely bigger. They're an extrapolation of what already exists, but they actually make you want to go there. And so what I would like to just urge as the different communities within Marin think about the future is that beyond the environmental issues involved and all, it's about building the kind of place that makes you enjoy living here even more 
and creates additional attractions so that your sons or daughters or their friends and all want to be here as well, not just to come and you know, go out to the specific place, but actually live and walk around. So I just want to wrap up there. I, I really want to thank our panelists for sort of framing our conversation for the evening and, and to crystallize what I heard the people on the panel say is, is how do we address housing, transit, environmental issues, climate change, and equity issues and simultaneously or in a way that sustains communities that we want to be in. And I, and I really want to turn to what may be the most important part of the evening now and that's to carry our conversation out to all of you. And I'm going to look through the cards that some of you have filled out and I will direct questions to our panelists. We'll do that for about a half an hour and then we'll open the conversation up uh, more, even more broadly for people who want to ask questions from the floor. So uh, first question, I think, Betty, is for you. Uh, what is your definition of equity, and how would you apply that definition to uh, Marin County's housing? Thank you. Equity means that we include all portions of our community uh, in our housing, which we don't do right now. Um, it's a matter of if you want to put it this way, uh, race, economic background, all kinds of uh, areas that we now exclude, we would include if we had equity. Um, and when you look at, again, our workforce, which is a service workforce, um, to exclude them is a kind of classism. Uh, along with racism and xenophobia, if you want to put names to it. So what I'm putting forward is a model of community which is very livable uh, and inclusive. And that means a whole range of housing types, not any one type, but uh, um, making it possible for people to, to buy, to rent, to share uh, homes and be part of our communities. Great, thank you. Uh, so, Bob, I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, what's the plan to reduce our global consumption footprint downward from five planets consumed annually here in Marin today to, say, 2.5 planets in 10 years? Not that, too tough a question. That's right? a lofty goal. Yeah. Um, well, I guess yeah, I don't certainly have all the answers, but again, I'd refer back to that slide that I showed about AB32. I mean, a lot of great minds went into trying to craft looking at all different sectors, you know, industrial, transportation, energy use, et cetera. And we need to get at with each of those areas. You know, it involves some changes in terms of personal lifestyles. It involves some changes in future land use. Um, and it probably also involves changes in some of our economics, and, you know, looking at the way that we subsidize certain types of energy and not others. So again, it's a very, very broad and uh, diverse range of, of actions that I think we'll need to take to do anything nearly that ambitious. Thank you. So Nona, I think I'm gonna ask you to respond to this question. Um, <laughs> which is titled Survival Migration. Um, the EPA predicts in 2013, 36 states will probably experience a water shortage. For survival, many of these people will migrate to areas where there are, is available water. The question is, is Marin County prepared for possible population growth due to survival migration? <laughs> Water is an issue everywhere. Water is an issue throughout California. Uh, it's not just Marin County. The perception may be uh, in other states that uh, because we have a delta and because we have a California water plan that somehow or other California is going to solve people's water needs. I have not heard this. I have not heard about this mass migration like uh, lemmings jumping off into the sea or jumping off into Marin. Um, I, as I've pointed out, we have some 
very distinct limits to what we can accommodate in Marin County, and sooner or later we're going to have to accept the fact that growth is not infinite. So I really can't offer a lot of hope to the migrants. Uh, I can say that we have huge water issues here in California. Marin County is, is fortunate in having a water supply that's local. Um, at the same time, it's not local. We're taking water from the Russian River. We're taking from the Eel River. So I don't think that we're going to offer any uh, water rewards to migrants coming in. I don't think I can give a, a stronger answer than that. Okay. So, uh, John, you addressed this a bit in your presentation, but this person would like you to elaborate. Many people in Marin are concerned about density, and yet this person's experience in San Francisco, uh, three to four story apartments are very livable. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, sure. <clears throat> uh, again, the, the, and I like the point, uh, I think it might have been Betty made about, you know, people hate sprawl and people hate density. Again, density is such an irrelevant word to quality of life. And, and people who, who emphasize the need for density for how, you know, to save the planet or whatever, it, it's just kind of the wrong word to use because it's irrelevant. Like the neighborhood I live in in Berkeley, um, it's a small single family bungalow. There are a number of two story apartment buildings nearby, but I mean the thing, the thing is, is like if you look at downtown Mill Valley and the core of it is, you know, nice and quaint and I, it's very cool. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. You can, you can tell my San Francisco architecture, urban design roots, it's like, wait, quaint, that must be bad. Um, but, you know, on the edge of Mill Valley, of the downtown, and I've, I think it's Miller Avenue, but I'm, I'm real bad with, okay. You know, you've got apartment buildings that went up, I believe, in the 60s that tend to be three and four stories. And what I, w I gave a talk in Mill Valley, um, a few months ago and after and I was talking about you know you look at those if you sprinkled a half dozen of those more of those in various spots in the center of Mill Valley once the trees grew a little bit nobody would notice just like they don't notice the ones there you'd build up the population it would create the housing options and it would make it a little you know it would just be a nice thing it would actually feel pretty good and what I was told is that those were built and when they went up they looked new and they looked different and there was concerns about who was living in them and so the zoning was tightened to basically prevent things like that being done again you know the fact is is that there are a lot of three and you know I, I guess my answer would just be what you do is you build nice neighborhoods you build including urban neighborhoods or downtown neighborhoods that have the density. Again, you look at downtown Sausalito, uh, near the water. There are four-story buildings, not many, but they exist. There are, you know, big two- and three-story buildings that have some oomph to them that could easily be four stories. Those things, you don't look at them and say, oh, my God, it's so dense. You look at them and think, this is such a cool area. Boy, it'd be fun to stay there. Or... So, you know, or I've, I've got a lot of money, I'm going to try and live there type of thing. It's all what you build. It's not three stories is okay, but four stories is evil, two versus three. You know, it just, that's not how the real world that we experience works. Thank you. So this is a question that perhaps is appropriate for both Bob and Nona. Uh, and it's an interesting comment, I think. It says, nearly everyone today wants to wrap themselves and their causes in the mantles of greenness and sustainability. But are they really? Lacking the as yet to be invented green meter, how can an individual citizen know what's what and who's who? Going forward, wouldn't it be a good idea to put our heads together and come up with some objective means of measuring the effects of proposed future development <coughs> on the wild environment as well as the existing human populations of our Marin towns? Yes, I'll take a, <clears throat> a, quick, a quick stab at that. Um, I, I think that what the, uh, the commenter is asking is what, what kinds of community indicators can we establish? What kind of baseline can we establish and then can we measure 
uh, how we become more green. What I didn't say in my own remarks was that there's a huge elephant in the room, which I think we're reluctant in Marin County to address. <clears throat> and that is the fact that what, notwithstanding the goals of AB 32 and others to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Marin County has the largest waste generation per capita. It has the largest ecological footprint uh, per capita. Uh, this is in the world, in the world, the largest waste reduction in the world. We have miles and miles and miles to go in Marin County, and that's the reason I question pushing the needle a few points by shifting land use patterns. That's important also. But that elephant is going to have to be tamed, and I don't quite know how we're going to address that beast in a county that is so affluent that it doesn't even understand its own waste habits. Well, that was certainly strongly said, and, and I concur. I think you know we, we in Marin sort of pride ourselves on our environmentalism, and known as quite right. Our affluence really does us in in terms of, of true impacts. I guess the question of what do we do? It is confusing. I mean, there's just there's a zillion different uh, answers out there on the internet or you know whenever you turn on the radio. I guess what I would say is look locally. Um, the great majority of the towns in Marin have done climate action plans. Uh, and that's been done with a lot of citizen input. They contain wonderful ideas. They would definitely put us on the path. I think the concern I have is that adoption of these wonderful plans is one thing, implementation is another. And implementation has really been slow. Um, a lot of it is the fact that, that cities are so strapped these days that this is not necessarily the highest priority. <laughs> but again, if we are to turn the corner, uh, we already have plans. We just need to make them happen. Great. Thank you. Um, Betty, next question is for you. Mm -hmm. Retrofitting on a meaningful scale should only be seriously discussed if neighborhoods close to services can be rezoned to moderate densities and single-family homes uh, remodeled in removed excuse me, in favor of small apartments and townhouses. How this might happen is first through political will second through incremental change. How might the political will occur? Any thoughts on coordination of town with town council objectives? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'm not advocating doing away with any existing housing. There may, might be reuse of housing. I know people have talked to me about the possibility of, of turning large homes into places where four people might buy and um, and share in their later years, that sort of thing. So we could transform some of the existing housing. Um, simply uh, buying and retrofitting existing housing doesn't create more housing, but it can make the housing stock we have better. And as you know, a lot of it is, is aging. Um, so it, again, it's one of those things where we take different steps. There isn't any one way to do this, but we can work with um, the existing stock we have. We don't have some of the buildings that we can turn into housing that they might have in other communities. 1H Street in Sanderville is a very good example of turning a, a building into mixed use. Uh, Rotary Manor in, in um, San Rafael was a school turned into senior housing. We have some of those opportunities, but, but not as many as, as in many other kinds of communities. But I say we just use the imagination that we must have in Marin to look at our communities and make them more vital uh, by, by using the space we have or reusing space, uh, making our homes more energy efficient. Uh, one of the problems is that energy, all the wonderful energy efficiency stuff is only for homeowners, and there's no incentive whatsoever for uh, landlords of rentals to do any of that. So those are the sorts of things that we can think about if we want to make uh, an environmental uh, step with the housing we have, but we can also look at it in terms of equity and, and reusing some of the housing we have so that it's more flexible. Great, thank you. I, I had a series of questions here that really relate to creating uh, green businesses and new businesses, and I'm gonna change the format a little bit, and I'm going to read you all three of these questions. They're related but not identical, and then ask any of the panelists for their thoughts. So the first question is, what is the possible impact of new green, low impact industry? How could such industry be encouraged and funded? 
The next one is, the Venture Greenhouse is a green business incubator originated through Dominican University. The focus is supporting startup businesses to get established in Marin. Each is focused on addressing a social or environmental aspect of our society. How do you see integrating these businesses into the limited space in Marin? Where is the space to house these new businesses? And finally and relatedly, what are the barriers you see for new businesses getting started in Marin? How can we overcome these barriers? So who'd like to have at it? Bob, thank you. Well, I think we really need Robert Eiler up here on the panel yeah, tonight we do. to <laughs> talk about recruiting green business. I guess, you know, from my perspective, watching you know, economic development activities over the years uh, from, from smaller cities, it is a heck of a challenge. I mean, you know, real economic development that really makes a difference tends to happen in the largest cities, San Jose, San Francisco, where they have subsidy dollars to give these businesses to draw them in. Here, you know, Marin is really going to always be a location for very small entrepreneurial businesses. Some start up here, some leave, some maintain, et cetera. So again, it's really hard to draw in those, those large, obvious green businesses, but we're seeing some of that. And I think certainly Venture Greenhouse is a wonderful uh, example of how to incubate those kinds of businesses. Sonoma Mountain Village in Sonoma in Rona Park has been doing this for a number of years. That's a great opportunity to launch these types of businesses um, in Marin. And I guess I would disagree. I think that there is a lot of space in Marin. There's space that turns over. There are small business parks scattered throughout uh, Nevada, San Rafael, uh, Sausalito. So there are opportunities for these businesses. And again, I think as the demand for green services, green products increases, so will these businesses. Great. Does anyone else like to comment? Well, it's just that I have a little problem with this as a type, a green business. What is a green business? And I've had a lot of contact with a whole variety of businesses that call themselves green. Are they in some kind of an environmental industry, like solar, installing solar panels? Are they a green in industry because they happen to have a, in their own activities, have a low impact on the environment? What is a green business, I think uh, it would be very valuable to begin to break those out and to understand what is really meant by a green business. Okay. Anyone else? No, all right, thank you. And now I'd like to move into a series of questions uh, about affordable housing. Um, and I'll start with one and then maybe read a couple through together. The first one is uh, NIMBYism, otherwise known as I got mine to hell with you, seems rampant in Marin. How can we break this mindset in order to give younger and less affluent Marinites a chance to create new types of communities? Betty, you want to take the, the first whack at that? Well, the questions about political will and about NIMBYism are related. Uh, I think one of the most important things is that people who want these things to happen, who want to be part of the decision making, uh, become a positive force to balance those who uh, who want to raise questions. At the same time, I think it's very important that we respond to the questions that people raise and together as a community see what we can create. Um, obviously, everybody's not going to agree, but a lot of people come with real questions and concerns and, and even fears that can be addressed. So we plan the time to do that and we also build support with those who do understand why this is important. Um, the only way to get political will is to build support. So that begins right here. Anyone else? <clears throat> so Nona, this is a, a housing related question that you might want to take on. Uh, what is the plan and how is Marin going to build more housing when Marin land is rare to build on? I'm not certain I can answer that. Um, okay. How do we build more when there's, yeah. there's I think, I'm interpreting the question, right. how do we build more housing for more people when there's limited land available in Marin that's the well, appropriate for building? We certainly can't move, we can't go out. <clears throat> we can't sprawl anymore. <laughs> um, we have some fairly expensive housing that continues to, in my, in my view, sprawl, such as very costly housing out Paradise Drive and Tumaron Peninsula, which in my view is sprawl, but we're talking about affordable housing and trying to find land for that, uh, there seems to be only one direction to go, and that's up. 
I think we think we have very little opportunity, but when we look around uh, in terms of reuse, uh, particularly there certainly are areas, and as I suggest, there's also uh, uh, airspace. So there's, there are opportunities without going into green areas. I think we all want to take this one. I agree. I think we can repurpose a lot of land, and, and that's where we're at. That's where we've been at in most of the towns in Marin for the past 10 years. You know, there, there is no more vacant land. Um, but we have seas of parking lots at shopping malls. We have uh, a fair amount of strip commercial that I don't think anybody is necessarily in love with uh, that can be repurposed. And lastly, you know, we're making an investment in a transit system here in Marin. And I think that, again, location, 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 we need to maximize the use of that new infrastructure. Yeah, and I, and I think, again, it, it kind of comes down to there's this um, notion of no land being available, but, you know, the outside eye, I think Bob touched on a lot with the parking lots and all, but also it becomes <clears throat> when there is land available, it means local communities being comfortable with just letting it, it gets to the whole, you know, people worry about three or four story buildings. Part of it just gets to the, just kind of let things happen. I mean, going back to Point Reyes uh, Station, there is housing that was built on kind of the north edge of the grid, um, like kind of a beyond, Toby's Barn and you know the restaurants that have been there forever and it I would read about it in the Chronicle for years all the fighting that went on so on and so forth and then finally the thing got built and I know it was fought and opposed and so on and so forth and the person you know as someone who just goes there when I saw what finally got built I just thought, why didn't you just take the grid that existed, flip it over, and build nice little houses like on the south side, which would have been twice or three times the unit count, which is a big red flag, but it would have settled in and nobody ever would have noticed, and it would have actually been an integral part of the community instead of this kind of loop that nobody goes on except who lives there. And when you go on, you think, boy, these houses all look super tasteful, but they're kind of out of place, and I know they're, you know, it, the, again, the issue isn't kind of how do we whittle down the unit count when there is land available. It's how do we reinforce the livability that we like and cherish in a place. So I think it kind of becomes flipping around. Once you do start developing, how do you measure what you're going to allow? And uh, that, that's kind of part of the trick, which is it's a hard one for any community to pull off. I'd like to, uh, there's a number of housing questions, but I'd like to just ask one more at this point um, so we can move on to some other questions here. We have many wonderful questions, and thank you all very much. So this question is, high-density housing will be built and owned by big corporations with lower tax rates than individual homeowners. Do we want corporatized housing to replace single-family homes? What will be the impact on, on dollars for infrastructure, schools, water, sewage, et cetera? with a reduced tax base. Betty, would you like to start off? Well, first of all, it doesn't have to be large corporations. <clears throat> I don't know where the idea got that that's how it happens. Um, we have examples in Moran of, of really beautiful uh, housing with a range of affordability that's built by uh, nonprofit uh, developers. These places do play school taxes, they do pay in for services. They, they do not take a free ride, and so that's also a mistaken idea. So uh, it, it, we're not taking land off the uh, tax rolls to have a range of housing choices. Yeah, I'm gonna answer. I guess I'm a little mystified by the question because um, the taxes that fund local services are not income taxes, so it, it, it's irrelevant as to you know, what the income of, of the property owner is at all. It's based upon the valuation of the development. And so, again, as you redevelop new development, um, the tax rate goes up for those properties when they develop. 
So uh, again, I'm not really understanding the tax question. Yeah, even even if they're market rate, um, it's as Bob says, uh, the tax rate is based on the valuation of the property, not the incomes of the people who live there. And just finally, the, the total contrarian point of view, I mean, if you look at something like all those wonderful Eichler homes in Lucas Valley, Eichler was a big developer. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the suburban tracks that people... That was affordable well, that, that, that's true. Which is, but I mean, in other words, a lot of the, the suburban template that a lot of people cherish and want to preserve, and in a lot of cases rightfully so, tended to be built after World War II by fairly large developers. So kind of the corporatization term is a bit of a red herring, I think. Which doesn't mean there aren't bad developers. <laughs> I'd like to shift gears now. And, and this question, the question is, how can we reframe this conversation to welcome in more county residents, including those who may not be motivated by climate change science? Can we start the public dialogue with what quality of life we want, accommodating our kids, grandkids, workers, livable communities, et cetera? Is it possible that raising the alarm about climate change is in fact slowing down common ground? Who'd like to, Bob? Mm. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I mean, there are different motivators for everyone. Um, you know, again, some are concerned about large-scale environmental situations, um, others about equity issues, uh, and again, as, as John points out, others are just interested in cool places to, to visit and live in. Um, so again, I think whatever motivates you, and I don't mean to steer a conversation strictly in, in the area of climate change, that's the point of tonight's panel. We're trying to really touch upon this from all different perspectives, and I think at least the four of us all come to sort of the same conclusion about the kind of thinking that we really need and the kind of discussions that we need to promote here in Marin. Betty? Yeah, I agree too. Uh, we won't all jump on the same uh, train, but uh, I think what Bob is talking about in, 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 and what we wanted to do tonight is to have this environmental understanding uh, because of who we are. I mean, we're, we're celebrating 40 years ago setting aside inland rural and coastal Marin and making a real statement to, to the Bay Area and, and, the, and California, and yet at the same time we have this other face, this very high ecological footprint. So we need to rethink who we are and uh, it, different people will get different places. There's a high motivator in wanting homes and places that are good for our families and our parents and our children and so forth. Uh, part of that is wanting the kind of world that we want for them in the future. Uh, part of that is understanding that the other children, the children of these workers, are going to be growing up in the same world as our children and grandchildren. So uh, we're connected. Uh, one of the things that motiva motivates me a lot is our impact on other counties around us. They have environmental and agricultural lands that are very valuable, but we've kind of disregarded that as we've pushed our workforce off. So I think we all t engage in this in different ways, but it's very important, I think, that we all take hold of the climate change story and, and see if we can not understand how we each make a difference. We can't just disregard it even though it might not be our primary story. Uh, I'll just make one, one comment and that is that I'm, I'm really uh, very pessimistic right now about the public consciousness of environmental concerns and climate change. Uh, in Marin County, I think we're unusual that we, we understand it my concern in Marin County is that we are, as I've said before, we are so accustomed to affluence. And I'm not talking about this group here. I'm talking about the larger public that still wants its minimum 3,500 square foot houses up to 15,000 square foot houses. We have many of those in Marin. And as long as we have that level of consumption and taking for granted the entitlement that many Marinites feel, we're going to have a very, very hard time addressing the real issues of climate change. Great, uh, thank you. And, and the conversation, Betty, that you, you suggested about children and grandchildren leads right into this next question. Uh, what do you believe are the most effective ways to get kids and teenagers in our schools to think critically and to solve these real world problems 
we face as a community. And Betty, you can certainly start, but anyone else? Well, my experience uh, when I was at EAH and having uh, high school kids come with various projects is that they are thinking about these things. They're, they're very much aware of them, much more than we were when we were kids. <laughs> Um, so I'm not worried about their concerns. I think the issue would be how do we perf how do we respond to them? How do we pr give them opportunity to work on some of the issues because they're already there. Okay. And John, I have a, a specific question for you. Uh, can you talk about livability and the problem of commercial rents being too high for small local serving businesses? There could be a specific example given is Mill Valley, but I think we could probably share that problem countywide. Uh, uh, the que so the question is? Uh, can you talk about livability and the problem of commercial rents being too high for small local serving businesses? Yeah, it's a, the whole challenge of commercial rents, I mean, it's, it's a lot like residential rents. It's a huge challenge and it's a huge problem and, you know, one of the banes of the Bay Area is that this place is too desirable. And I'm not just talking, you know, flocks of people who are going to come here seeking our water. Um, when, once they drain Hetch Hetchy, no one will be going to San Francisco for that. Um, but, but the whole issue of, you know, unfortunately, this is a roundabout answer. First of all, I totally agree with you. I am lucky enough to live in a neighborhood in Berkeley that I couldn't afford to buy in now that has a lot of nice little local food retailers and you can walk to the cheese shop and you can walk to the local independent market and so on and so forth. But it is real tough because there's a commercial drive where, you know, if Ralph Lauren wants to be in downtown Mill Valley or wants to be in Sausalito and there's not zoning to prevent that type of thing, they're going to pay a lot more than the shoe place or the bookstore or whatever. Um, it's a really tough dilemma, and it's a tough dilemma made worse by the fact that for many good reasons or whatever, people love convenience. And so, and I think this, I don't know how true this is in Marin, but I've been really struck watching, you know, efforts to kind of rebuild downtowns and so on and so forth, not just in the Bay Area, but beyond. Everybody wants a lively downtown and they want things they can go to, but they're kind of doing all their shopping on the internet or at power outlets. So it kind of changes into the downtown becomes a wine bar and a coffee place and a few cool restaurants. And if the community is affluent, a clothing boutique and a kind of neat modern-esque knick-knack shop. I mean, it's, it's very difficult because a lot of the small local retailers who provide services, their customers are getting older. So I'd, unfortunately, I don't have an answer except a community courageous enough to instill commercial rent control in some districts, you know, and with an eye to, you know, San Francisco has chain rules, it has commercial rules, you know, it, you can very much go back and forth on the merits of those. But a place like Marin, the driving economic forces make that kind of local presence tougher and tougher. Okay, so next question. How do we motivate the public to develop eco-friendly lifestyles such as turning off their cars when not driving, installing timers to manage electrical use, and of course recycling? Nona, did you, would you like to take a stab at that one, or Bob? No, I'm giving you all the good ones, Nona, come on. <clears throat> oh gosh, change your light bulbs. It's, you know, I'm tired of changing my light bulbs. I cha I've changed all my light bulbs, and you have probably all changed all your light bulbs. Um, what can we do that is, will make a major, major dent in our consumptive habits in Marin County, and, and I, I, I frankly, kind of stumped. We have efficiency, of course, is the, and I'm not an expert in efficiency. There are people here in the audience who are, but we have not, we have not plumbed the depths of water conservation, for example. We have not plumbed the depths of energy efficiency. We have a long, long way to go, but I, I really am not the expert who can get into really the, the, the technological approaches. Perhaps you can in your climate action plan. 
Well, that is the crux of the biscuit, trying to get individual change. And there's been studies done, and, and you know, people who uh, believe that they're responding to climate change because you know, they take bags to the grocery store or change some light bulbs, and, and therefore they've done it all. Um, I guess I, I, wouldn't, I can't miss an opportunity to, to plug what I think is a very unique local program. I've, I've done a lot of research on social change um, science, and I think that, at least when, from what I've read, the real issue is not just, you know, again, putting somebody to a website or giving them a list, a checklist. It really is, again, coming down to community. And the Resilient Neighborhoods program, uh, Tamara Peters is here and will take signups, uh, has started here in Marin. Um, They're working on a, 100 households. They get together in groups of, of five households. And they, they walk through a, a simple program, um, different options. Um, they make commitments to one another. And it's, it's those interpersonal commitments that seem to make the biggest difference. Um, so again, I think that that has a lot of potential. And uh, if anyone's interested in that, I'm sure Tamara Peters will be happy to sign you up tonight. OK, so here's your next comment and question. This has been a very interesting and very reasonable conversation. But isn't anybody panicking? Parts of our county very soon are going to be underwater. <clears throat> we are living on the brink of an unimaginable catastrophe. What planning is occurring to deal with the looming crisis? Bob? I thought Bob was <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I say, I mean, the, the good news is a lot of our communities have done a lot of planning, and there's been a lot of public involvement in that. And yes, I'm totally freaked out if, I haven't, <laughs> if that hasn't become clear. And that's why, you know, personally I'm working, trying to work on, on many different levels, you know, in, in local policy, in advocating for federal energy <clears throat> policy, um, doing education, um, you know, and then again, even looking at, at my own home lifestyles and trying to, to make changes. And again, I think for those of us who are really concerned, we need to step up. We need to take action yeah, in, in a very broad manner. Um, last week at the Eco Fair, Van Jones was there speaking. And you know, I think his main point was, uh, responding to some disappointment in the current administration was, you know, where are people rising up? You know, when, when the administration came to Washington, there was a huge backlash. I think Van Jones called it the orcs coming over the, the mountains. And there was no backlash to that. And so I think his point was, if we're really concerned, what are we each individually doing? It needs to be significant. Great. I'm going to ask uh, one final question of our panelists before we move into our, our other, our alternate format of questions from the floor. And this is a request to each of the plant panelists to look into your crystal ball and describe Marin County in 2035. What I'd like to see are the continuance of our wonderful variety of little downtowns that have added housing over shops and increased uh, the, the uh, ability of people to walk to work and walk to shop and um, a good place for children and for old people um, while we have easy access to open space and, and good food and clean air. Um, really working at being a model, um, doing the kind of planning that um, will, in, will change some things, um, but will uh, keep within the character of what we have now. Uh, I'd like to see that's where we are, and well, I'd like to see anything in 2035, but that's what I would hope for, Marin. <laughs> My expectation would be a place that from the air looks very different than it does now. Um, I mean, I kind of agree with the question about sea level rise, but one reason Bob was able to show those images is that the Bay Conservation and Development Commission a few years ago generated the scientific studies because they, you know, unless you believe that it isn't happening, um, and you're right, the what will happen is there will be a sea level, a change in sea level, and the thought of BCDC was by, by kind of mapping things out now, we can begin to think about how to plan for it, which 
include shoreline remediation, so on and so forth. Um, so I think, some, I think Marin in 2035 from above will not look very different. Um, in terms of how it would look on the ground, I would guess that the more kind of legendary aspects of Marin, the, you know, like the cool little roads you zip off, or not zip off, but wind away in in Fairfax or Mill Valley or a number of other communities, those will also look the same. I would guess that the central areas of most of the communities will look different and will look a bit taller, not 20 stories, not 10 stories, not eight stories, but a little taller, a little more developed, a little more oriented toward pedestrian scaled movement. Um, not so much because of corporate developers, but because of younger residents and new generations who come in who have different values. And that's something that is being seen in San Francisco. It's being seen in a lot of Bay Area communities. And there's a lot of tension right now because we're going through a generational change. And the, the principles of the 60s and 70s are themselves being refocused and readjusted by people in their 20s and 30s who care every bit about a much, as much about the environment, but who view environmentalism through different lenses. So I think you will see a change on the ground in the heart of Marin communities, but I don't think you'll see a change on the edges, and I certainly don't think you'll see a change from that level of the protected space. Perhaps I should envision the Marin that my grandchildren will experience in, in uh, what, 2035? 20, Is that 25. what we're talking about? Um, and I agree with, with Betty. I hope that they are living in environments. I hope they can afford to live in Marin County, for one thing. Uh, I hope that they're living in communities, uh, two of them live in Novato, where they can still walk and feel the sense of a of a small city, small town, small town. Uh, I agree with John in that looking from the, an aerial view, we will not see a huge difference. But I'd like to focus on what what we might be looking at along the bay perimeter, because we have all expressed deep concern about about sea level rise, and that is that as we continue to explore what I would call the soft approach, that is to say, the soft edge approach, building marshes out and not retreating in, but mill building marshes out, perhaps with buffers, and this is being explored on, on, on many fronts, not hard edges necessarily to keep the water out, but rather soft edges to buffer the storm surges as they begin to increase, because sea level rise as you know, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't go on in a, very, in, in a constant smooth way, but rather evidences itself in, in, in storm surges. So <clears throat> if we can treat that together among the various jurisdictions that line uh, San Pablo Bay, work with our surrounding counties, and, and begin to build those soft edges, we will be buffering sea level rise as it gradually begins to encroach and we'll be able to protect our major infrastructure and the communities that are already developed in those low-lying areas. Well, I guess I'm fairly schizophrenic and I run the gamut from being pessimistic one moment to very optimistic the next, but let me stay on the positive. I, I do think that Marin is going to look a lot more sustainable in 2035, and I think we're going to sort of be forced into that. I think everyone will be by resource limitations. I think energy prices are going to go up significantly. Water prices will. I think those economic drivers will ultimately make the difference, and I think Marin is beautifully positioned for that. Um, you know, we already have, as we've talked about, we have, you know, the, the basic structure of very compact and walkable town centers throughout Marin and we can link them better with transportation. Um, and I think we will learn how to do infill development in those town centers in a way that you know, people will really relate well to them. I think we have the design techniques, we just need to come to agreement on them. Um, I think local business is going to um, 
be on the rise because I think the model that we've developed, you know, the Walmart target models of importing goods from overseas, once transportation costs go sky high, I think that model is going to, going to implode. Um, so I think we're well positioned with small businesses and I think that they will ascend. Um, as Nona points out on water, we have, we're 70 percent self-sufficient right now. I think we can get to 100. I think we can get that additional 30 percent, again, when the will is there, when the cost goes up to the point where conservation makes a lot more sense than, uh, than desalination. And I think our transportation network, we're going to view smart much as the rest of the Bay Area does BART today. You know, they couldn't imagine living in the Bay Area without BART. And I think we're going to feel the same about smart. And I think it will connect, again, these walkable areas with that infrastructure. So again, I think Marin is beautifully positioned to be responsive. Great. Thank you. I would now like to invite people who want to ask a question from the floor to step up. Greg, I, I believe you have a microphone. Uh, do we, ha we, have one, we have one microphone, right, Greg? Yes. So if everybody would line up. Line up. I am a human microphone stand, except I won't right. relinquish the microphone. And, and uh, I would. Because some people are too reluctant to <laughs> and, relinquish uh, it themselves. And I would, I would ask people to be as concise as they possibly can in their comments or questions so that we give everybody a chance to make their comment or ask the question. And if you want to direct your question at someone in particular, feel free to do that. Okay. So first up. How to be concise with a messy mind. Um, tomorrow night in Fairfax, there's going to be Sustainable Fairfax is putting on an event at the Fairfax Community Church at I think 645. It might be 7. I should know because I'm doing something there. But it's put on by the Zero Waste Committee in Fairfax. And I think the t title of it is Talking Trash. And it's going to be bas basically about our trash and what we create, what we consume, and what we kind of leave in our wake. Um, I have more just kind of comments than questions, and I read something a while back, I forget where, but a 5,000 square foot like super green house in like Mill Valley or <laughs> Kent Woodlands or something, and to me that's, I mean it's great, but it's a failure, it's not, it's not greeny green to me, it's too much consumption and too much waste and we don't need 5,000 square foot houses, you, you know, whatever. Um, and in terms of climate change and conservation, we're on the edge. But still, most of us, we tend to hop in our cars, turn the keys, and go. It's like that's our first line of whatever we do in operation. We don't, we still don't try and avoid making trips to the market and think, okay, I can do that tomorrow with that trip, or I can just go out like two days, or I'm going to ride my bike or whatever. It's like we're primarily consumers in general, and that's the way that we've been raised, and it's a hard switch to go from being a consumer and mm -hmm. let's see I got a few different notes here is there is there a question in here I don't want to cut you off I'm but we, we, you have a long line in back of you conservation is more important than consuming and we need to switch to a conservation conserving society rather than a consuming one and that's the job thank you um, I like the panel's comments on this uh, scenario that would give the, the lookout in Bob's crow nest uh, digital binoculars. Um, the, so here's the scenario. Okay. Every, every home will have two to three kilowatts solar panels on the roof and a wind turbine. Okay. Uh, battery volume weight to charge ratio will be 10 times more than it is today. There's a, a company in Berkeley right now producing those right now as I speak. Uh, generating more electricity than consumed, charging the electric car every night, the energy, uh, I wish I had my glasses with me now, the, the energy to, to manufacture, the energy will be, excess energy will be used to manufacture these batteries and the solar panels, and the turbines for the, for the wind turbine. Uh, I'm asking for comments on that. Comments are fine. Okay. Um, uh, thus, home insulation will become irrelevant. It, it won't be efficient unless everyone lives in a single family home. Multi-story multi apar apartments will not be energy cost e efficient. 
um, retail outlets like uh, Best Buy is, is going bust as I speak here, could become more like showrooms, charging for emission from online purchases and credits. Um, co computing. Are you are you close to the end of your comment? Oh, I'm just carrying. Uh, I have I have more information, but I wish I had my glasses with me now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But the the issue is that we're not really addressing the real future here. And that is you know, 50 years from now, and I think we should be planning for that right now. We should be looking at maintaining subsidies for solar and uh, uh, introducing a future that, that you can see 50 years from now and planning for that right now. Thank you. The, the biggest impact on the climate comes from our cars and reducing that impact can only be done if there's convenient transit and also a lot more bike riding. And we don't have that convenient transit. Um, and, and so that's how to get more sustainable. To get more transit will mean struggling with very powerful institutions who currently capture vast amounts of money, both for highway building and for running the Golden Gate Bridge. There were decisions made recently about our Marin Transit uh, contract, um, which gave up the opportunity to greatly increase our service. And there were uh, the possibility of taking money away from future highway building it, building and putting it into transit operations as part of Marin's element in the regional transportation plan. These were not choices made by our elected officials. To, to change the environment is going to ch require very difficult political choices, things that people are not focused on and are not connecting the dots. And I want to stress that in terms of the fight um, with NIMBYs, NIMBYs are concerned um, both about change, but also about traffic, about parking, about the issues that other people's cars would bring into their neighborhoods. And so, as I see it, only having adequate amount of, trans of convenient transit is the way to start having dialogues about what is the appropriate amount of housing that should be in a downtown. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening. Uh, I hope I have good news. What would the panel think of uh, an electric streetcar uh, running from, and a demonstration line uh, running from uh, Fairfax to San Anselmo down center? This is on rail in the street with cars and is no overhead wire. Uh, this is a fuel cell with lithium batteries. Be running every 20 minutes all day long, and it goes down Miracle Mile, then down 4th Street to the Smart Station. It's about connectivity with Smart. What happens if you get off Smart, you gotta rent a car? And a trolley can run for years and years and years. And, and people, you know, the bus system that we have right now, studies have shown that like 67% of the people don't like buses. That makes it really hard for the bus people. And and tr trolleys are an economical way to do this. Who would have thought that HUD, FTA, and the EPA would put together a business plan that could save the planet? It's a public-private partnership where cities and counties would not be responsible. So the county is looking, going to be looking seriously at this this spring, and there'll be more news about it, but we're going to need your help. And so I have some brochures here and love to talk to anyone who has an interest. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank anyone you have much. a view? Uh, very briefly, we've got a long line. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask their question or comment, but does anyone I mean, on the my, panel? My, my quick comment would be connectivity is very important. I mean, I have no idea about the, <clears throat> the structural merits of that system or putting fixed rail or the cost, but I mean, you do need to get people, you know, 
you need the theater lines into the larger system. That's all. Okay, thank you. Well, it's with some trepidation that I change the subject a little bit. First of all, let me thank you very, very much. This has been a very interesting and informative panel discussion, and I really, really appreciate it. I think we've all learned a lot. One of the things, what I, when I looked at this choosing the future we want, um, I'm very, very concerned that uh, MMWD is planning, is doing an EIR on seeing about putting Roundup on the watershed. And this is so scary to me. The future I want does not have poisons in my water. It does not have poisons in the air. Studies in glyphosate, uh, studies on the Roundup have shown that not only does it go in the water, in the groundwater and around, it also goes in the air, in the air that we're breathing, and uh, et cetera. Uh, it's shown up in so many, there are a number of studies that have come out very today, we're, we're learning about, and all the time. So the future I want, all of these, Things are very, very important, but in addition uh, to have the, the water, not to be afraid of drinking the water, uh, and the fact that on our wildlife, on our plant life, and on our, our uh, children and their children and ourselves. So that, I just wanted to bring up that. And, and, I, and I'd love to have the comment of the panel uh, on how we can uh, being getting people to work for the future that we want. Uh, a clean future, safe future, uh, air, water, and um, the other elements. Thank you. Let me make just one comment on the, on the first yeah. question, which is the uh, MMWD Vegetation Management Plan, which is proposing two, has really two major alternatives that are proposed for their various means of uh, approaching invasive plant species. Um, I think what we'd like to see is a very thorough environmental impact report and what you should do, I understand your concerns and you, what you should do is to make sure that your questions are submitted to MWD during the month of October when they are preparing the scope for the environmental impact report. So we all want to get that kind of information and so I urge you to get those questions into uh, to the MWD uh, board, of, board of Directors. Thank you. And good evening. Thanks for all your comments. I have um, two, qu two questions. I'll try and be brief about this, but I need uh, particularly the, the two at, the at either end to answer them. First, I think it's important, how do we get our politicians and our public officials in this county to, uh, to implement the whole concept of workforce housing? It's very important that we stop the outside commute uh, that, that San Rafael approved to target. And they, they think, I'm going to believe that the employees are going to come from within the county, considering how much they pay. So I want, so that's one question. The other question is, 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 is that you do have to have, in order to have affordable housing, there has to be some density to make that happen. So the, so the issue is you have the canal area. There's, people have fear of the canal area where it's perceived as a lot of crime because there's a lot of density of housing. And then you have all those apartments along Nova Albion where there's very low crime rate because actually it's a mix of housing. So how do we instill upon the politicians to, to, to not listen to the NIMBYs but to, uh, but to actually realize that we have to have affordable housing? Bob and John. Hello? Hello? Yep. Hello? Yep. Uh, the way to instill courage in politicians is to show up with a lot of people to kind of give them a little backbone. I mean, if I'm a member of the Planning Commission and I have 20 people tell me that a two-story building will be the end of life as they know it, and if I've got one or two usual suspects saying workforce housing, workforce housing, I'm going to respond to all the concerns raised to me by those 20 people. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that, that is a political reality. In terms of what you talked about with the Canal District and the other areas, um, I was actually driving around the Canal District, and it's not even that dense. There's a, anyway. But it's fascinating in San Francisco. You have, and it's actually kind of getting less. You've had all these fights over the years about if we build nonprofit low income housing, it's going to be like those housing projects. 
you know, which are crime swamps, and they often are, so there's some validity in that. The nonprofit low-income housing that gets built is very well managed, it's very well constructed, and I know of no issues where things have become new blights in their neighborhood because things that get built and are built new, besides the physical thing, they tend to be managed well. And if you've just made that kind of investment to build workforce housing with a mix of incomes, you're gonna make sure it works. Because you're gonna, if you're the nonprofit developer doing it, you're going out looking for other jobs. And when you go to the next planning commission, you want people to stand up and say, they did a good job in this other community. Well, the only thing I'd add is that uh, we're always glad to take people on tours of actual uh, workforce housing around Marin County and, and let you see it and talk to people. And, and that will help you understand and be an advocate for it. It's, it's nine o'clock now, but I, I would ask if our panel members have the stamina and if those of you in the audience have the stamina, I'd like to continue on for a bit so that we have an opportunity, give an opportunity to everyone who's standing up to make a comment or ask a question. So if that's agreeable to everybody, let's keep going. So the but issue do of waste, keep it concise. Oh, sorry. Thank so the you. issue of waste generation has been brought up several times tonight, and I wanted to bring up the issue of waste disposal in our community. So looking at our 2010 numbers, Cal the average person in California disposed of 4.4 pounds of waste per person per day. <laughs> The average person in Marin actually disposed of 3.9 pounds per person per day, which translates into a recycling rate for our community of about 77%, which is higher than our counterparts in, South San, in San Francisco, who are claiming to be one of the best material managers in the community. So looking at a 77% recycling rate for our JPA means that we're in a fantastic position to tackle zero waste in our community. One of the ways that we're doing that are pilot programs where we're sending organics to anaerobic digestion facilities and our water treatment plants, utilizing the energy potential of organics before sending that compost to help reduce water usage or pesticide usage on agriculture. We're also expanding programs of commercial recycling and also addressing the issue of generation. So although generation is a big component of our material problem, I just wanted to raise the issue that we're also in a really fantastic position to be a zero waste community by 2020, where the state of California wants to achieve 75% by 2020. Yep, that's, let me just make a comment. That's extremely, extremely <clears throat> encouraging. The, the number that I did not give a number when I said that, uh, <clears throat> that Marin County had the highest solid waste generation in, in the world, I was taking that from a website for the 2040 uh, Mill Valley General Plan. It's from a workbook that is a collection of statistics and demographic information. Right. And that probably did not, was not accompanied with any detail as to what kind of solid waste, uh, the metric used to measure it, and so forth. So, so I appreciate that input. No problem, and if you wanna check, the numbers that I'm getting are actually from what we report through SB 1016 to CalRecycle for our communities. So that'll, that'll be what you'll see as the recycling rates for the communities. I'll just add, I'm also really encouraged by uh, our zero waste efforts. I call this the decade of zero waste, and I think we're, we're making great inroads, and the cooperation among cities has just been fantastic. Um, I guess I, I would caution, though, that when we define zero waste, it's really about 95% elimination. That remaining 5% is the real tough nut, which is all the stuff, the packaging, et cetera, the stuff that you know, can't be repaired, so it really has no destination except the land use when it's, when it's worn out. And it's those things beyond Marin that we really need to get at uh, from manufacturers, making them responsible for packaging and take back of their products. And I will say that Marin Sanitary Service is doing a great job with um, EPR programs, and ex which is extended producer responsibility, where we're actually encouraging the producers of those to take responsibility and accountability for it since they are beyond our scope. So thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Callahan. Uh, I have a small business uh, two blocks away on B Street here, and uh, my store is about uh, repurposing and reusing uh, waste uh, from our community. And I've been there for three years, and um, I've always been in involved in waste in some way or, for in f or fashion in my life, probably about 60 years. Uh, I'm sort of the sort of a guy that's. Uh, has great passion, great hate for waste. And uh, I 
I guess I had the fortunate opportunity of following the lady that just made the presentation about 77% uh, recycling rate. There is nothing further from the truth in this county. We're not even close to the 72% or 73% or 74%. We waste more in this county than anyone can ever imagine. And um, the reason I'm saying this is that when we recycle, we think we're doing a great job. We're not. Recycling is, 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 is okay. It's a net net zero. What we need to do is reuse and repurpose stuff. We talk about new housing, new structures, new buildings. <clears throat> if we just took the, uh, de the, the materials coming from our construction sites, from our buildings that are being torn down, all the building materials, and put them to work, not at zero scrap value, but at uptrace value through reuse. Minimally, in one year from today, we could put $85 million of new revenue in this county. And we can put everybody to work in this county who wants a job, starting at the people at the bottom of the list, the homeless, the handicapped, uh, the unemployed, uh, the statistically unemployed, uh, the high school students. Uh, it's quite impressive what we're possible, or the, what, the, what the potential is. One last thing. Um, <clears throat> I did uh, put together a plan, and I have a plan that outlines this complete program. I prepared for the city of San Rafael for Mayor Bloomberg's uh, project in uh, the Mayor's Challenge, giving away $5 million to any city in the United States of 30,000 people or more who could put together programs that benefit people. So if anybody's interested, it's about taking our waste putting it to work, not in the landfill, and not getting scrap value for it. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Supervisor Sears, I'm here to recruit you and your backbone for diversity. We are under a voluntary compliance agreement in Marin because of 15 years of neglect of the analysis of impediments to fair housing. There was one accomplished two years ago and there are a lot of programs about to increase equity and the representation of protected classes in the decision making and the population of Marin. As we pointed out earlier, 60% of our employees come in from outside Marin. They're not the high income people who drive in to work in Marin. There's a certain amount of environmental injustice in segregating, establishing land use patterns that do not provide for the diversity of affordability or different types of housing. I have a confession. I've gone back and read the countywide plan since 73, and every time, especially this last one that was approved in 2007, the diversity of zoning designations have always been beaten back because of the obstacles of water and traffic. Water, for example, if you look at the usage, skyrockets in summer. Now I take a few more showers in the summer, but it's not because I take more showers that it skyrockets, it's because we like to grow roses and have lawns. Grow cyanithus, grow uh, lavender. You don't need to tax people who would otherwise be able to live here if it weren't for the water restrictions and the zoning restrictions to live in Richmond and further out and pay high transportation cases. I challenge you, each of you, Nona and Bob and Betty, to develop policies that provide for diverse housing so we can bring our workers home, so that we can build a strong community that does not segregate, that does not separate one class, one race from another. You look three miles to the east or three miles to the south, it's a very different complexion. Why is that? Part of that is answered in the analysis of impediments that was done by uh, fair housing. And I think that's a good place to start. 
I'm disappointed equity was in a larger discussion tonight, and I hope it will be next time. Thank you, Dave. Uh, does anyone want to make a comment? And Dave, I want to thank you for the assistance you're providing to the county in making sure that the uh, implementation plan for the analysis of impediments to fair housing is achieved successfully. So thank you. I just want to acknowledge this handsome microphone stand one more time. <laughs> um, Bob, when you showed the slide with the various wedges, one of them was related to transportation. Um, 42% of uh, trips nationwide are two miles or less. And um, one of the ways that we can uh, slice a significant piece off of the transportation wedge is through increased uh, walking and bicycling, which has been mentioned a few times from the, uh, from the podium tonight. Um, the county of Marin and several of the cities, most of the cities here in Marin have a goal of 20% walking and biking by the year 2020. Um, bicycling, as many of you know, is the most efficient form of transportation, uh, using about 100 watts of energy versus 15,000 for a car. So, and, and humans aren't producing greenhouse gases um, um, it, that I know of. I know cows do. Um, but um, bicycling in Marin County has uh, increased 159% to 172%, depending on whether you're talking about weekdays or weekends over the last decade or so. And transportation in Marin is 62% of greenhouse gas production. And so, and, and, and incidentally, SMART was mentioned a couple of times as the train, as one of the solutions to that. But the SMART system is a SMART train and pathway, which will create a significant number of new bike facilities up and down the north-south corridor. So I do have a question, actually. And my question is, do any of you have any recommendations for furthering the uh, non-automobile, uh, people-powered, uh, non-motorized transportation here in the county? Thank you. Uh, super quick, how do, how do you um, increase the non-motorized transportation? Part of it is making the means available. I mean, again, you look at a lot of the major arteries here. They ha some have bike lanes, some don't. Good bike lanes, separated bike lanes do attract people. But it is also the generational thing I mentioned earlier. I was talking with an architect last night who designed two very large apartment complexes in San Francisco, one of which is done, one of which is breaking ground. Each has like, I mean, a lot of units, 700 or whatever. The one that is done, got finished a few years ago, has 100 bicycle stalls in it. The one that's about to break ground has 400 plus bicycle stalls in it it has a dedicated elevator down to the bicycle parking area with the bicycle repairing area, so on and so forth. That's because that's what the residents of the building want. In other words, different generations are looking to travel in different ways. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I can't imagine in Marin County a more effective lobby than the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. <laughs> Uh, they're ex ex extremely effective, and I think if you're trying to promote more use, uh, access for bicycles around the county, they're the ones to go to. I have never seen them shy away from exerting political power to make things happen, and they have indeed made things happen. I just want to uh, quickly say two things. One is Safe Routes to School is a fantastic program uh, that does offer uh, sidewalks, protected ways, uh, and, and ways to get children to school so they don't have to go in a car and get dropped off. Um, the other thing is that there's lots of uh, studies that show that if people will live within quarter mile, half mile of transit, that they will use it, or that they will walk or they will get out of their cars. Uh, so again, we're back to offering a range of housing opportunities close to where people want to be. Andy, I, I wouldn't even try to compete with you in terms of ideas for promoting bicycle use. But again, I think it, it really is. It's, you're creating the infrastructure, you and others, uh, and government in this county is creating the bike infrastructure that we have to have. And again, it's through land use. And the last piece I'd mention is that in several of the climate action plans, they talk about looking seriously at bike share programs. And I think hopefully that TAM will take that issue on, because uh, I think there's a lot of potential, particularly with SMART coming to uh, really try to initiate bike share. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, I want to talk particularly about the city of Santa Fe. Uh, number one, I called the city several times about two empty lots, which would be ideal for 
a four or five story unit for elderly. We have a 10 year waiting list for elderly for housing. And one lot is every year they sell Christmas trees, been on the market for years on uh, Third Street. And another lot is on Lincoln, on the corner of Lincoln and Fifth. Uh, the city says, oh, they don't have the money. They 50% of the income of San Rafael goes to pensions. Now, how do you think about all the people in San Rafael who work in sales, who work in nursing, who work in all those jobs? They don't even have pensions. They don't even have retirement. They have nothing. When they are 65, they have no place to go. 10-year waiting list. Then, Mrs. Buck left all her money for the elderly, and low-income people of Marin County. All what they do is build those fancy big buildings. There are hundreds of research in all America who do the same research. We don't need another research for Alzheimer's for all those ailments. We need have the people live well who are living now and who are older and low-income. That's what we need in San Rafael. And then in San Rafael, all those big buildings they built down on 2nd Street, no housing. Everything is big buildings because it gives them more money for their pensions. They do nothing. And then they spend all the money in the canal area. Every time when I call, they say, oh, that is uh, federal money. There is always an answer. But nothing is done downtown San Rafael. We should have a big homeless center in Marine County. We shouldn't have homeless. We are a wealthy county. Mrs. Buck left the biggest, biggest funds in the United States. And we could have a wonderful homeless center, one for gentlemen, one for uh, couples, one for mothers and children with a health care center where they could be rehabilitated. I'm from the Netherlands. We don't have the problems you have here. We have cozy little towns. We can walk everywhere. And here, if I come from Europe, wherever I travel, I cannot imagine when I come back here and I see all this in a wealthy, wealthy county of Marine County. And they have an answer for everything. But nothing is being done and there are no resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next. In order to reduce Marin's environmental footprint, give ridership to SMART, and provide affordable workforce housing, do you believe city staffs, county staffs, elected officials, and Marin environmental groups are ready to reinstate a train stop at St. Vincent Silvera so you could build that kind of village along the railroad line? Anyone want to take that on? That's what we talked about all <laughs> night. If you're talking about it, are you willing to do it? Well, I, I guess I'd say, Dwayne, that uh, I don't think the issue is necessarily the train stop. It's kind of the cart before the horse. I guess the question is, what's the potential to develop at St. Vincent's enough to make a train stop there reasonable? And I think you know it's the land use question first before we get to the, the transportation question. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's been, sorry, it's no, been no. a land use question for, for 30 years. Um, and as it stands now, the uh, countywide plan would allow a development potential primarily on St. Vincent's lands, equivalent to the traffic generated by 221 units or some equivalent development. Uh, I think that for the time being, that is off the table. Uh, if it comes back on the table, it will encounter probably the same kinds of counter arguments from the environmental community that his, his, his has engendered in the past. Okay, thank you. Uh, John given, King. given the time, I'd like to uh, take only two more comments here. I think. Hi. You you asked what kind of future we want to live in. The future I want to live in has environmental justice in it, in which we do not plan. Uh, development in areas uh, that are unhealthy for people to live in. And by this I'm referring to plans to, to create housing 
too close to freeways and major roads, which is a major mistake that has ma been made in the past uh, in many of our big cities uh, and has resulted in uh, very elevated uh, lifelong asthma in children. It's resulted in cardiac risk to seniors, et cetera. Th cancer, there are many, many studies out there and they're all conclusive. So I'm very concerned that our future plan uh, precludes that kind of inequity, uh, particularly if it involves making vulnerable people being placed in vulnerable places. In addition, I'm concerned if we're talking about places that we're not placing people also at risk by putting them too close to areas that are going to be impacted by sea level rise and flooding. Uh, we need to not make the mistakes that were made in, uh, in uh, other places where hurricanes hit, where they destroyed their marshes, they didn't allow for buffer zones, and they put housing too close. And I think we're very vulnerable to making the same mistakes here in Marin along our bay shoreline. Thank you, Ann. Uh, two comments. Um, one comment is uh, one thing that could directly improve the lives of people living in poor communities, not just here in Marin County, but nationwide, and make them much safer places for people of limited economic means to live, would be to support an end to the war on drugs. I think that most of the crime that exists in these communities and we can see it from the statistics in our prison populations, is a direct result of this meaningless, futile, and I think uh, uh, incredible act of injustice uh, called the war on drugs. And I think that it would be something, an uh, act of courage from the Board of Supervisors to actually uh, show some enlightenment from the County of Marin and stand up against this idiocy that we've been involved in for the last 70 years. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that uh, I uh, do not believe that there is any real energy shortage. I think the energy shortage uh, theme that is being promoted is a theme being promoted by people for a particular purpose. And I would ar urge you to, uh, if you want to uh, see why this is completely untrue is to buy the book Superfuel by uh, David Martin, which explores the work of Dr. Uh, Elvin Weinberg and uh, Eugene Wigner in the development of a very clean uh, uh, thorium-based energy system, uh, which was developed by the United States Air Force and was uh, torpedoed by Richard Nixon. Uh, and uh, Admiral uh, Rick Hover uh, in favor of uh, the current uh, nuclear energy fleet that we have today. And I also would urge you to uh, take a look and Google uh, Dr. Judith, um, uh, Dr. Judith Wood, uh, who is a uh, physicist working in the area of uh, material science and her current exploration of the work being done or had been done 100 years ago by Nicholas Tesla in his effort to uh, discover the source of free energy. And I think that even right now, uh, this work has been resumed un un in secrecy by the United States government. And they actually have uncoded much of uh, Tesla's work. And in fact, we could be on the verge and I know that the head of the National Association Clayton, of I Science. Can I ask you to wrap it up? Yes, here? I would say the head of the National Association of Science in China has been given a, a several billion dollar budget to pursue this. And um, I think uh, if we're looking to have enlightenment against in the area of energy production, uh, I would urge Superfuel, Dr. Judith Wood. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I said I'd only take two, but I think I got a third person who just snuck in here. No, that means you. <laughs> okay. You're, you're the third. Bob, you've been a great, it. okay. okay. Uh, Bob, you've been a great uh, uh, microphone stand. I want to thank uh, Bill and uh, Marge and all of you for putting on uh, this great um, forum. And also for all of the panelists for uh, enlightening us this evening. Uh, call me a fool, but I'm really very optimistic about the future of Marin County. 
I'm really excited about SMART. I'm really excited about the bike paths that are being implemented as part of SMART. Uh, I think that uh, we really have a marvelous future and we're building a tremendous armature upon which to build that future. We can make with the will to stand up before our county, uh, county supervisors, before our city councils to support projects that we see are bringing diversity to community, bring our communities bringing additional density to our communities in a properly designed way. If we stand up to support these projects, we can help implement this future. It's up to all of us to stand up and support a positive future for our community. It's up to all of us to support SMART. It's up to all of us to see that obsolete sites along the SMART corridor are properly developed to allow for housing for our children and for our parents. And I think that we are seeing the beginning of that today, certainly with the construction of SMART. And I'm looking forward to a great future. And I'm looking forward to working with you uh, in the future to make these things happen. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that concluding comment. Kiki. I, I really want to th thank our panelists, but also everyone in the audience who came here and participated in this conversation tonight. As I, as I said at the beginning of the evening, I really see this as the first conversation in an ongoing dialogue about where we want our county to go and how we want to get there. So um, I'm sorry we lost some people. We went over time, but I think that's a great sign. And I really look forward to future events of this sort. And I wanted to remind everyone that if you do want information about follow-up meetings and television coverage, be sure to provide your email address uh, on the sign-up sheet near the door. But again, thank you very much. A fabulous group of panelists and um, wonderful evening. We're adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.